Welcome to Slash Forward. The house that Jack built is a brutal and compelling examination of the psychopathic mind. But does it have a point or purpose? Bleak and unnerving, it's often critiqued for its apparent nihilism. But that doesn't mean it's not worthwhile. Let's take a look at its content so you can make your own assessment. And we open with a narrative in which the titular Jack explains he's going to tell his story in five incidents, chosen at random that took place over a 12-year period. And the first one finds him driving along a snowy road when a stranded motorist flags him down. He is reticent to provide help beyond showing her how the jack is broken and giving her the name of a good blacksmith. But this lady knows how to get what she wants and push herself inside despite the obvious potential danger. You might as well be a serial killer. Then the sheer volume of detailed suggestions she provides for going about such an activity reveals the extent to which she has been consuming true crime podcasts. He tries to drop her at Sonny's, but she absolutely insists he would only be a fair to middling Samaritan if he failed to see this through to the end. Of course, the return trip involves more aggressive talk of murder, and Jack can't even get out of park before Sonny's efforts prove to be substandard. It ultimately doesn't matter a lick that Jack has finally found the courage within to tell this mother figure no. She continues to berate him, having assessed his character to be comprised of chicken shit, only to learn in the end the less obvious ways in which the jack is broken. This imagery is juxtaposed with great works of art, which is how he views his accomplishments in this realm. Then, for a little background, we learn that Jack is an engineer by trade, but is an architectural hobbyist and considers it to be the more artful form of technical creation. He's also a man with a large inheritance, a plot of land, and a plan. He is fastidious and organized to a fault, as we'll see later. He's also the proud owner of a failed frozen pizza distribution hub out on Prospect Street. A rare L for ya boy, but the equipment undergoes a rebirth of sorts in light of its new usefulness. And just to put a pin in things, Sloppy as this first attempt was, he managed to ditch the car in an adjacent jurisdiction. And as far as he knows, Sonny never felt the need to say anything, so the dots were never connected. As we open on a recounting of the second incident, we find a woman with a trolley walking the residential fields. She is being hovered over by a man now beholden to his blooming psychosexual perversions. He's a bit of a people watcher and a raincoat enthusiast, so this new interest suits him well. He approaches his target it, but is absolutely winging it without having worked out the sweet talking part yet. Police. May, may, may I uh, come in? I'd like to see a police badge. An improv class or two would help prevent him from cornering himself as he struggles to explain in simple terms why it's good that he doesn't actually have his badge on him right now. That's considered classified information? That'll do. She holds strong on the badge policy, which he commends. But the longer he stays out here, then the more people are likely to see him with her. Hi, Glenn. Thinking quickly, he switches careers to an insurance agent and ensures her that if she ingratiates herself to him, he can expand her late husband's pension. The promise of an increased passive income stream does the trick, and he works his way in. Then he further garners her sympathy by lamenting the absurd nature of these humiliating situations that he is constantly forced into, that so frequently end with banged knees and physical violence. When the first round of throttling doesn't take, he begins to lose his nerve and attempts to nurse her back to health like a little baby bird, delicately feeding her the donut equivalent of pre-masticated insects. But when she attempts to get up to leave, he quickly sets to removing any further concerns over pensions. Now that he has time, he springs a leak in her chest to make sure there will be no future awkwardness. He then poses her just so in order to put together a really terrific composition with the moon in the background and everything. When he's all finished up, he backs up the van and carefully deposits her into the cargo area like a rolled up carpet. He then spends a good amount of time resetting the scene inside the house before heading out. But of course, his OCD won't let him truly rest, and no matter how much more he does, he seems destined to be terrorized by his intrusive thoughts. Only the incoming sound of sirens prompts him to actually leave, but still not fast enough. Luckily, they make their first stop at Glenn's house to get the lowdown. This gives Jack time to dump the body before the officer addresses him. He checks the van as a matter of procedure, and then asks if he's seen anything that evening due to some break-ins they've been experiencing in the area. No break-ins, but speaking of strange scenes, he verbally diarrheas all up in the officer's grill about how he was there to collect some old railroad magazines Claire had from her husband. Anyway, she went in and never came back out, but he is a huge fan of railroads, trains, and monthly periodicals. 
so he waited in the hope she would eventually emerge. The officer takes a look around but doesn't notice anything immediately untoward. It's an absolute mystery that needs to be unraveled, but it doesn't require Jack's presence. And in point of fact, his absence would actually be preferred. So he ducks out and quickly ties up his prize, then waits for his moment and bolts. He drags his precious cargo all through the town, leaving a thick trail of blood, hair, and face matter that leads all the way back to his lair. This seems pretty undesirable, which is why the heavy rains that then come down give him the impression of being blessed by God's grace. As he becomes more comfortable, it's revealed that expressing emotions is more of a learned facade for him. As a young boy, he enjoyed running out into the reeds for hide and seek, as if he wanted to be caught by the trail he left behind. He took pleasure in few things as much as laying by the fields and listening to the rhythmic breathing of the men and their sides. Back to the retelling, he explains that over time his compulsive fear of capture diminished, which allowed him to take greater chances. As an example, he was not at all happy with the photographic outcomes of one victim in particular, so he actually chose to return to the scene, adding to his body count along the way. After he got everything set up to his satisfaction, he snapped off some bangers that he was so proud of he sent them off to the local paper as a little treat since they don't usually get big stories like that. It remains to be seen if this will backfire, but with these feelings of confidence and self-assurance, he began the construction of his house. The third incident is from a time when he was looking for more, and he had forged a relationship with a woman who had two boys. He did his best to teach the oldest Georgie about handling firearms and to have a reverence for hunting and killing. He even lets the young lad pull the trigger, although he only hits a flank. There is then a discussion of the importance of order in hunting. For instance, if you kill the doe but miss the fawns, they'll go off and die without the proper care. No, in order to maintain balance in the woods, you have to go from youngest to oldest. It's the ethical thing to do. As you may have anticipated, this plays out in real life as we check back in on the picnic to find Jack in the tree stand as the mother struggles to maintain control of her boys. Her inability to do so results in their destruction. The tone of the picnic takes a somewhat more sour note after that, as she is racked with guilt and he is insistent she let her boys taste the delicious pie he brought. Then he uses her favorite number as a prompt for counting off the amount of time she has to clear the field before he starts shooting. When he does, he gets a hit but arrives on the spot to find that he just winged her. No matter, as after a short hunt, he manages to track her down and finish the job. And thinking back, he was really worked up and agitated that year, what with the eclipse and the nearby eruption of Mount St. Helens, the proximity of which was enough to prompt him to reconsider the materials he was using to construct his house. Now, now fully matured in his new role in nature, he takes pride in his development and sophistication and employs his intricate and exacting standards on the new construction. The next incident recounts a period of time where he learned the value of feigned vulnerability and in so doing, forged a relationship with a young woman that generated feelings stronger than what he should have been capable of. She had a sense of his defect that arose from the void behind his eyes, which she interpreted as an indication that he was preparing to leave her. But with some distance and only the sound of his voice, he is able to convince her of his commitments and reassure her that he has no intention of going anywhere. But of course, after a couple of drinks, he's right back on his bullshit. Got great tits. To make her feel small, he calls her simple as a pet name. He's also taken to suffer her general degradations and even eventually admits to her that he's a serial killer and strongly implies that she could be his next. This is so boring though, he's boring, but it's also a little alarming when he starts drawing on her with a clinical coldness. She runs outside and finds an officer who she solicits for help with her boyfriend who's acting weird and admitted to killing 60 people. Unfortunately, the presence of alcohol means that he can't legally do anything in this situation, even after Jack joins the production and admits to everything she told the officer. A little feigned sorrow gets him back in her good graces, and she brings him back upstairs so he can get some rest. But when she attempts to call her pill guy to get him something, she finds the line has been cut. Then when she goes to the door, her keys are gone. When he confronts her, it dawns on her that the crutch was a lie, which is good because it means he's a liar, so he probably didn't kill anyone until... You're Mr. Sophistication, aren't you? 
She allows the thing that's been in the back of her head screaming for attention to become fully formed. He gives her a little time to have a yelling session so the cruel apathy of our modern world can wash over her first. And that is a commentary on society. Then he lashes her to the radiator, and in a moment of thoughtful introspection, he notes how men are born guilty and viewed in that manner no matter what they do. And that makes him sad to be so unfortunate. It kills him on the inside. She will be the one dying on the outside tonight. In the ensuing interlude, it's noted that while these stories seem to paint trusting women in a negative light, these are the ones he chose to tell of the many options available. So you can draw your own conclusions about the reliability of the narrative. Outside of this hobby, he has bulldozed his house at least three more times in the pursuit of achieving the perfect balance between art and utility. The final incident finds us back on Prospect Street, where Jack does a little welding before bringing back his first live victim. And and mail to boot. When he gets him inside, we see that he's got a whole setup going on here. He goes on to explain that in celebration of German ingenuity, he is recreating rumored execution methods employed at the end of the war for ammo efficiency. But the newest victim is ex-military, and rightly points out that his round is not actually a full metal jacket, so it won't penetrate. This buys them some time while he goes to complain about the mislabeled box. But when he gets to his favorite spot and begins to care and out, Al starts talking about receipts and IDs and whatnot. That is not bro behavior, bro. So Jack tears off down the road while Al makes a phone call. His intense frustration causes him to slippity-slide off the road, but he's within jogging distance of his shadier contact. He finds betrayal here as well, as the police have been coming around looking for him. They know what you've done. But this is all about a robbery for some reason. That's the one thing he hasn't done, but he has sat down and held at gunpoint all the same. The investigating officer isn't immediately available, so they're left to wait an unknown amount of time. This gives Jack time to butter up his boy by thanking him for freeing him from his life of thievesmanship, which has been a tremendous burden. Since he is ready to accept his fate, and in SP's estimation, Jack is truthful to a fault, he does eventually convince old SP to lower his gun. Then, once close enough, he gives him the classic chin-up lad before acquiring the object of his attention. The officer arrives some time later, and since Red Cloak's RSP's signature look, he is ill-prepared for the outcome. Jack arrives back in the squad car with sirens blaring and is pleased to find the victims did not use their extra time productively. The ordnance specialist signs off on the ammo, and he continues his experiment. However, he quickly discovers that he is too close to find focus. So he uses a length of pipe to work at finally opening the stuck rear door that he's never passed through. He gets the distance he needs, but before concluding the experiment, yeah. Someone calls his name. He discovers a man's been in here the whole time, but also with him throughout his adventures. It's Verge, the gentleman he's been conversing with throughout this narrative thread. Verge points out that Jack was to be building a house through all of this, which hasn't gone as planned. Then, as the police announce themselves outside, the difficulty of ever finding closure on the construction portion seems to have risen. After a discussion of architectural theories around building material, Jack feels encouraged to make do with what he has, and ultimately builds a house that is uniquely his own. With that task completed and nothing left to lose, he follows Verge into a mysterious hole. In the epilogue, we learn that we began with the ending, and that the underlying conversation that has connected these stories was had on this quest into the depths of the Inferno. It's a long journey, at times pleasant and picturesque, at times tight and moist. They pass Elysian fields along the way, which they have no access to. This is kind of his jam though, so that's really too bad. They ultimately find themselves in the deepest circle, but only to quench Jack's thirst for knowledge. His fate resides a couple circles back. Across the bridge is the way out and all the way up, but the only way to make it there is to traverse the outer wall. No one has ever made it across, so this is not recommended. But Jack is a man who cannot pass up an adventure, especially if it benefits him in some way. So Verge takes his leave as Jack begins his climb. But about halfway across, he discovers what he couldn't see from the bridge, which is that there are no more footings. And he dangles there until his grip eventually fails him. Well, that was bleak, but that's Lars von Trier. I can only hope you didn't draw any positive lessons from the examination of Jack as a character. Character. Although if you are interested in a deeper analysis of Dante's Inferno, watch this video. Now that we're here, I want to congratulate you for making it to the end of the video and affirm that you are a very special person because of it. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.